WrestleTalk! Jade Cargill finally lost the TBS Championship. Karen Jarrett got the biggest heel pop of the night. And Takeshita just turned heel on the Elite, all because of that goddamn carny piece of S-word, Don Callis. I'm Ollie Davis, and welcome to the AEW Double or Nothing 2023 review episode of the WrestleTalk News. Before I start, if you haven't already, hit an exploding super kick on that subscribe button and enable notifications to always on. As I'll have another episode coming up today with all all the fallout from Double or Nothing. Who knows? Maybe there's been another backstage fight over a muffin. Having notifications always on means you'll get notified first when it goes live. The buying pre-show match saw Hook teaming with Matt and Jeff Hardy to take on Firm Legacy, The Guns and Ethan Page. Unfortunately, I just don't like watching Jeff wrestle anymore. Moral issues aside, he's just not very good and looks like a shadow of his former self. It's depressing. The final few minutes were fun though, with Jeff managing to land all his swanton weight on a Double Guns cover, Double Guns, title of my next wrestling pay-per-view, and Hook got the submission win. The main card began with everyone already around the ring to start the opening Blackjack Battle Royal for Orange Cassidy's International Championship. The story being, Orange has finished a man a week for over 20 weeks now. But can he toss off 20 men in one night? Like your mum. In classic AEW Battle Royal style, what are the rules? What? are the rules? What are the rules? As rather than the match starting once all 21 men were in the ring, which would have made it ridiculously crowded, most of the participants began brawling outside. Swerve was able to stand outside for practically half the match. Usually you'd have everyone start in the ring, but just get out by going underneath the top rope. Nevertheless, the action was super fun with loads of great spots thanks to my all-time favorite new show, Brian Cage vs. All the Luchadors, but also because it furthered a bunch of under and mid-card feuds. Ricky Starks continued brawling with Jay White, Big Bill got to last until the final three, and Swerve Strickland and Keith Lee exchanged a few spots in their storyline that will never have an actual singles match. The final two was where the magic was though, as Cassidy and Swerve went immediately into a fast-paced back and forth singles match. Swerve is so good, I wouldn't have minded him winning the belt here. But Orange managed to win again, doing a low effort super kick on Swerve, holding on to the rope with his one hand to get rid of him. This was very good. What wasn't good though, was Chris Jericho versus Adam Cole, which I think we might be able to count amongst AEW's worst pay-per-view matches. Sabu's last minute shoehorned in addition made even less sense in the actual fight. The special enforcer that Jericho would have presumably had to have signed off on in their unsanctioned contract, so it already has a logic hole chair shot to the face, brawled with the JAS immediately and, let's say, fell with style off the top rope through a table outside. Him and Roderick Strong somehow fought off all four of the JAS members up the ramp, never to see them again, leaving Cole and Jericho to go a long 17 minutes. Which also had a Britt Baker and Soraya running spot, but nowhere near the levels we'd expect from an unsanctioned match, which ended with Cole hitting two booms, one with a chain wrapped around his knee, and the referee calling off the match because Cole wouldn't stop punching Jericho in the face. Yes, an unsanctioned match. The idea being it's a feud so intense the company officials will not endorse it, ended with company officials calling for the bell. It was a huge anticlimax and killed the crowd for the first 15 minutes of the following match. And more depressingly, as this is a Jericho feud, Strap in for another six months of the same match. It was later announced we'll be getting Cole and Baker versus Jericho and Soraya in an intergender tag. They're going to need to do something special to get this feud back on track. The best idea would be to get Jeff Jarrett to book it, as it was his trademark TNA overbooking that came to the rescue next. FTR and Team TNA were wrestling a decent match, but the crowd was a bit dead, until Jarrett accidentally hit special guest referee Mark Briscoe with a guitar. A tactic? that was never going to work, as Mark would have definitely seen all the bits of guitar debris everywhere, even if it did hit the intended target of Dax. So Aubrey Edwards ran down instead to count the pin, who got a guitar smashed in her head by Karen Jarrett. And even better, Karen Jarrett fell over after she did it. Oh dear God, oh no. They're definitely building to Aubrey versus Karen. Karen got mega heat, making the final five minutes really lively, which FTR won, embracing their buddy Mark after. Looks like FTR will enter Ricky Starks' Bullet Club Gold feud next, as they saved him from another beatdown backstage. Christian versus Wardlow for the TNT Championship was initially a more cerebral match than the crazy, high-flipping or multi-man ones we've gotten used to, which I really appreciated. It was a lot of Christian cutting off Wardlow with counters or timing in 
instead of the big crazy moves because they were saved for the end. After a dodgy spot that saw the ladder turn into aluminium foil when Wardlow jumped on it, we got to the real match. Luchasaurus versus Arn Anderson, which saw Arn practically bite Luchasaurus's thumb off. Wardlow then climbed the biggest ladder physics will allow and destroyed Luchasaurus with a swanton bomb through two tables below. Arn then pushed Christian off another ladder perfectly into Wardlow's arms for a power bomb, and Wardlow retained. As usual, a very impressive showing from Wardlow, but he does remain the person in all of this I'm least interested in. Give Arn the belt. Presumably because of Jamie Hayter's real arm injury, her women's title defense against Tony Storm was more of an angle than an actual match. The outcast beat her up before the bell for Britt Baker to make her second run in save of the night, but in the end, it wasn't enough. Tony won with a sudden anticlimactic finish. I don't begrudge AEW here though, they did the best they could with the situation, and Tony as the new women's champion both gives the outcast some much needed credibility, and it could build to Hater winning it back in Wembley. The acclaimed and daddy ass ended the open house challenge next, fighting House of Black for the trio's championships. But as funny as Max Caster rapping Buddy Matthews is getting cucked by Dominic Mysterio was, as Buddy's real life girlfriend is Rhea Ripley, <laughs> he also said, they don't need to choose an extra rule for the stipulation. I really want the open house concept to get over, but I feel the opponent's choice section is getting consistently undermined, like when the best amigos forgot they had to do one. The 20 count and no rope breaks never really played into this story either, even though they had a spot right there with Bowen selling his knee. The match was really fun because, of course it is, but the overall feud and Malachi's stipulation was very undercooked. This felt more like a trios match with dark lighting, rather than unique rules being used to tell a different kind of story. That he asked got the hot tag to lose, I think this could have been left off the card. Thankfully, Jay Cargill's feud with Ty Valkyrie has got her back to feeling big time again, complete with fun TikTok dance routine entrance. Ty has been the most serious threat to Cargill's reign ever, thanks to her being a far more credible wrestler than Jade's TBS division usually provides. I even bought into a title change at one point with Jade's amazingly late kick out off Ty's road to Valhalla. Cargill got the win with her version of the move though, prompting Mark Sterling to say Jade's so good she could wrestle another match right now. But there's nobody left in AEW's women's division to do it. Apart from Britt Baker. And Sheeta. Rio. Serena Deeb and Ruby Soho still there just be leaving. Just, just leaving. But wait, wait. Just one more thing. As Chris Statlander made an awesome comeback, winning a short match and becoming the new TBS champion, ending Jade's 60 long undefeated streak. Ah, it was nine off a perfect number. Nice. Not a good weekend for long women's title reigns that we're all bored of, but a great weekend for finally shaking up those title scenes. In the first of the double main event, yeah, that's right, AEW is so minor league they only have two main events, MJF defended his world championship against Jungle Boy, Sammy Guevara, and Darby Allen. The match was already awesome from the entrances, with Darby playing a short film of him beating up a Max stand-in at an Elvis wedding, and Sammy announcing him and Tay are having a baby with placards. As in, well that, that reads weird when I said they're, they, they're not having a baby. They haven't had intercourse with some placards. Though. That's how they communicated the message. Nevertheless, I still don't like Sammy. The in-ring action here was sublime. We always talk about modern triple threats being so much better than the old three ways, which were mostly just singles matches with one guy doing this. What's well, my spot now? What the four pillars did here felt like a watershed moment for the fatal four-way concept, where everyone is involved in every single spot. A top rope Spanish fly outside onto the two other guys, quad near falls. All four men getting each other in holds like it was a human centipede of submissions. The layout of this match was admirably innovative, with four-way spots I could never even have imagined, let alone seen before. This was four hungry young guys tearing up the art form and writing it anew. Most importantly, it also had substance. With Jungle Boy this deciding not to do a heelish act on Derby, and MJF winning after Derby accidentally struck the world championship during a coffin drop, letting Max retain with a simple headlock takeover. The brilliance continued as Justin Roberts announced, S-word is about to hit the fan, because it's time for the other main event of Anarchy in the arena. It was the same heady mix of insane boundary-pushing high spots and storyline substance we'd seen in the four-way, just instead of flips, 
It was bloody, bloody violence. All initially to a live soundtrack of a band playing Wild Thing. Bum, 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 bum. A homage to the first Anarchy in the Arena match where they kept Moxley's music playing on the loudspeakers. It was absolutely nuts living up to the Anarchy name. Claudio's pile driving Matt Jackson in a car. Mox is using a barbed wire covered super sized poker chip. Referee Rick Knox is busted open. I still don't know how that happened. Production cut to split screens to keep track of everything, just like how the fate four-way push the boundaries of what that stipulation should be, these eight guys were inventing something totally new, fusing the cinematic match of the pandemic with a live crowd experience. My only pang of longing was, oh, Eddie Kingston would have loved to have been in this. Matt Jackson hit an exploding super kick. Mox dropped Matt's bare foot onto thumbtacks. Kenny and Hangman fought out together like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, but ultimately that carny piece of S word Don Callis played the decisive role. Having a heel turning to Kesh to stop Kenny's one-winged angel, letting Wheelie Yuta get the pinfall win. A great bit of proof that the Blackpool Combat Club elevate their young stars to be better than them. No doubt a trait that might have influenced Takeshita to join them. We now have a five-person heel group. The road is paved for Ibushi to join the elite, culminating in this year's Blood and Guts. An absolutely incredible two closing matches, a really fun opener, and the Statlander angle to end what was an otherwise below usual standards AEW pay-per-view. Double or nothing 2023 is 93%. But what about that other epic saga in wrestling? Find out what the Bloodline have in store for us next. Zane's unforgettable Royal Rumble chair shot heard round the world the catharsis felt when Jimmy Uso finally snapped and super kicked the soul out of Roman Reigns well and truly stole the show to the point that I don't think anyone remembers that Natalia wrestled for a title. Not only was it long overdue, Jimmy that is.